It's my pleasure now to um, introduce Associate Professor Nikki Kilpatrick. She'll be known to many of you, having been in, living in Victoria before, but gone away and now come back for us. So she, oh my God, she's got so much spaghetti after her name. It's like, it's enough to feed a family of 10. B, D, S, P, H, D, F, D, S, R, C, P, S, F, R, A, C, D, S, P, D, Director, Clef Services, Royal Children's Hospital and Senior Research Associate at the Murdoch Research, Children's Research Institute in Melbourne. Nikki's had over 30 years of experience as a paediatric dentist in clinical service, teaching and research. In 1999, she was thrown in the deep end of clinical leadership as Director of the Department of Dentistry and later as Chair of the Medical Staff Association at the Royal Children's Hospital. She embraced these opportunities and engaged with the broader health community to promote evidence-based child health and to advocate for paediatric oral health services. In 2010, Nikki became Professor of Paediatric Dentistry at the University of Bristol in the UK, but has since been dragged back to Australia by her husband. Hmm. In this presentation, Nikki will share some of these experiences, both positive and negative, and reflect on the learnings and identify the key roles that clinicians play in leading cultural change. Please make Nikki feel welcome. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't know, um, my husband is a double bass player, he's a musician, and uh, he and I have been talking about today for the last couple of weeks and sharing, well I was trying to find inspiration about what I was going to talk about, and we've been talking a lot about leadership and teams, and it's interesting because a symphony orchestra is actually not dissimilar to a healthcare organisation, and it has a leader at the front, um, that was Simon Rattle, one of the most famous conductors in the world and his band of 100 or so musicians. And musicians are highly skilled technicians who start life and practice for hours on their own, quite an isolated lifestyle, and they give up a lot to become um, a master in their clinical or technical skill. And then they come into a team. And there are a number of different personalities in this team. If you're a flute player, you tend to have long hair and go to the hairdresser a lot and need a lot of space. If you're a violinist, you sit at the back and you scratch away and you're the workhorse of the or orchestra. If you're a trumpet player, you are the, uh, you know, the, the sort of kingpin and the real prima donna. If you're a bass player, you just want to be in the pub and get it over and done with as quickly as possible. <laughs> And the conductor has to lead that team and bring that team of passionate, highly skilled people together. And people often say to Stuart, my husband, what, is that, what does the conductor do? And like a lot of us in healthcare, Stuart will say, I don't know what he does, you know. Because conductors get paid far more than musicians. In fact, some conductors, like Simon Rattle, get paid more for one concert than the whole orchestra does for that same concert. So you can imagine the tensions between the players and the leader. And that, to me, is a little bit about where healthcare and being a leader in clinical, in a clinical leader is very similar. And we're a very diverse group of clinicians. So I'm, I haven't had my inspirational moment yet. Werner said I had an inspirational moment in, at 3 a.m. in the morning. I have been awake for hours over the last two weeks, and I have had no inspiration. So I did what I always do is I go to the, um, I go to, you know, I think about my own personal life experiences. And so I had a bit of a think about the people in my life who've been in for formally, officially, have meant to be my leaders and whether I followed them or not. And there are a wide range. And all of these people I have followed or not followed at different times in, in my life. 
And one of the things they have in common um, is that they've all made me do things that I really didn't think I wanted to do. And you have a very good example of that right here in this room. <laughs> because this woman made me say yes to something that I've spent the, la the, the subsequent two weeks wishing I had not said yes to. And if that's what makes a good leader, you have an excellent leader. I went then, my next default is to go to the literature, being apparently an academic, and I looked up clinical leadership, and I was horrified. In the last five years, over 20,000 articles on clinical leadership, and I didn't have time to go through all those articles, so I was really stuck. And Deb had said to me, Nikki, just come and talk a little bit about your experiences. You're a great leader. Well, I have to say, having listened to this morning, I was just looking at that slide that Peggy put up of about 25 different competencies to be a leader, and I'm thinking, I really, you know, that was a scary slide. Then she put up a nice short one, but even that didn't help me. I am a firstborn, so I can tick that box. I am not tall, but I do wear heels to make myself a little taller. <laughs> Personality traits. Now, this really worried me because she said... You had to be smart and sane. I am not smart, and I am definitely not sane. So I, and then finally, it was great man. Well, I'm neither great nor am I a male. So I'm not sure that I'm the right person. So can you just consider this next 20 minutes a bit of light, fluffy entertainment after lunch? And then you can get on to the, 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 the important stuff afterwards, because I haven't had an epiphany, and I don't think I'm possibly the right person. But because Melissa made me put my slides together on Tuesday, and I wrote back going, oh, but I haven't really worked out what I'm going to say, and I got this, you must send your slides in straight away. <laughs> I put some slides together, which may now not match what I'm going to say. So you can either look at it, you can listen to me, or if you just want to put your headphones in and ignore the next 20 minutes, that's fine. So I picked, which I always do when I don't know what I'm going to talk about, some vague topic with a sort of stupid title that could mean anything. And so we had the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I was waiting for my epiphany. It's all right, if I put good, bad, ugly, something will happen. Nothing really has happened, but I'm going to share the good, the bad, and the ugly of my experiences as a clinician. I'm going to start with the bad, and then go to the ugly, because I don't want you walking away with the worst ones at the end. I'd like you to go away thinking that I've had some good experiences as well. So... <laughs> I went back to the UK in 2010, and one of my responsibilities was to run a national, UK-wide, Northern Ireland, UK-wide, um, clinical audit of cleft lip and palate service outcomes. So the UK had centralised cleft lip and palate care about uh, 12 years ago, and this was the first time in that since the centralisation of services that they wanted to know whether they were making any difference. And the job, one of the jobs I had to do was to go around all the cleft lip and palate centres, there's 15 of them, and collect data on all their five-year-olds with cleft lip and palate. So it was, it was an, lots of interesting challenges, lots of um, good things, lots of tragic things. Um, but one of the things, there were two things, well, one, there, was two little, there were two of us who went, Martin and myself, and we drive around the country endlessly. And there were two things we did. We had a, a poll on which hospital had the most expensive car park, and that was Manchester Children's at £22 a day, which is about $45 a day. Um, so they won the most expensive car park, which is a bit sad for a children's hospital. Um, then there was the, which Martin used to watch me with interest, was the how long does it take for the people at the front desk to look up and say, can I help you, poll. And that was, was really very interesting, but there was one that took over three and a half minutes. Now, that doesn't sound like a long time, but if I was to stand here for three and a half minutes, just stand and wait for you to wait for three and a half minutes, it's a long time. And the tragedy of what, um, or I became increasingly frustrated, stroke interested, that the front reception of your healthcare organisation is the face of what our patients see. And I turn up, and I, I mean, I, maybe I do look, I don't know, what. Well, perhaps I... I don't know whether I'm invisible or really you wouldn't want to say hello to me, but I would stand at the desk. Martin would stand over here with his stop clock timing me. <laughs> and I'd just stand and I'd look and I'd wait. Three and a half minutes for someone to even look up and just say, you know, I'll be with you in a minute. And half the time, the people on the desk weren't even apparently doing anything. They just had their head down or they were looking at a computer. And again, it's absolutely fine 
If they're doing, you know, I'll be with you in a minute. And that tell, that's something I feel quite strongly about in my team, my organisation. It does not cost money. We're not talking about resources. We're talking about an attitude and a culture. And my experience, that experience, was just one of several challenges to me of going back to the UK. And the other one was about three days into my first theatre session in the, one of the hospitals I was working in. It was my first operating list, due to start at half past eight. But operating lists are expensive, really expensive resource. And the list is meant to start at half past eight, so I'm in there at half past seven, and I'm clerking my patients, checking them in. I've got lovely little SHO, or whatever, DF753, or whatever they call them in the UK now. Um, and at half past eight, we're all in there. We've done our group hug, the love in, and all this stuff that you do in theatre. What time did the patient get on the table? Ten to ten. This was half past eight. Perfectly ordinary dental list. Nothing major. And I remember just standing, and I, I'm new. I really don't want to be really painful just yet. I'll be painful later on, but let's try and go, be nice and let's fit in. Anyway, I did a little bit of causal analysis, and I run around and tried to find out what was going on. Um, at the end of the list, when we did finally finish, with the threat, of course, of cancelling a patient because we were running late, um, the anaesthetist, who'd been around for a long time, was my age, and he just came up after and said, Nikki, thanks, it was really nice working with you. He said, can I just give you one word of advice? Don't bother. <laughs> and I said, oh, sorry. And he said, just don't bother to try. Give up now. And I was a brand new, slightly, I mean, I'm a middle-aged woman, but I'm quite enthusiastic, and if I say I'm going to do a job, I'm going to do a job. I just, and I said, what do you mean? He said, just don't bother. We've all been there. We've tried. We can't do anything about it. It won't happen. Don't kill yourself. Just come in, do what you can, and go home again. And that's profoundly depressing. And in an organization, and it's, it's only one experience in the UK, and it's not reflective of the UK, I'm sure, but it was one, another experience of lack of leadership, of a lack of a culture of leadership and ownership of the service that they were we were providing. And I think I was most sad because the, the anaesthetist who stayed with me, we worked together for the whole of that year, he'd been a head of department for eight or nine years and he'd stepped down and that was fine. Um, you know, he was a person like me. He was enthusiastic, committed, very well-meaning, very good anaesthetist, but he'd given up. And, we, and the challenge for us in clinical leadership is to find a way of uh, engaging with the doers on the floor and the doers who are delivering, and I hear it even today, you know, people going, oh, it's all great, but we've got to see those patients. Someone's got to treat the patients. And that's a real dilemma and a real challenge for us. And when you are a clinician, it's really hard. I mean, even the slides this morning, you know, resource, resource. We need time to do peer review. We need time to do clinical audit. Somehow we have to find and make that time, and the leaders in the organizations need to work with us to do that. And one of the things in the NHS that I found very hard was that I couldn't find a way where my leadership skills, or lack of them, but my, my willingness to contribute to the organization was not um, engaged with. It was not picked up. I kept offering to help. I kept trying to understand. I kept making meetings with people, and every pathway was being blocked to me, and hence my colleagues, who'd been there before, said, don't bother. And that's a real challenge, and the learnings to me in that, that sort of three-year period back in the UK was one of the problems was I had responsibility. I had targets. I had waiting lists. The 18-week issue in the UK was alive and strong in 2010, and I'd get these reports of 18-week people who had gone over their 18 weeks, but I had absolutely no authority to bring about any change. Every part of my clinical service was run and organized through other silos and other streams, and I couldn't find a way of bringing that together. There is a tendency when crisis happens to micromanage, and we micromanage and we count what is easy to count. So we count throughput, we count fillings. We don't necessarily count quality. And what came across really loud and strong, and it's interesting now I'm back in the children's because we've got some similar issues, is the sense of disempowerment amongst clinicians, all clinicians. My colleagues, who were bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and paediatrics generally brings nice people around. People are generally nice in work in paediatrics, but they just had given up. They'd 
They were disempowered. And what happens when you disempower is you give up trying. And I could see that happening. And I, could, I, I have done it. You know, I've been in places where I've gone, oh, yeah, I know that's not right, but I'll just go home. There's no point trying. I haven't got any more energy for it. It won't get me anywhere. But there is also a sense in the clinical workforce, particularly amongst doctors and doctors and dentists, of that sense of entitlement. I am a doctor, I am a dentist, and I deserve to be able to do, to have, to behave in whatever way I want. And that's where the NHS is now trying to work on some of those, those issues. But I think it's very s sad that in the NHS at the moment there are two initiatives. One is called putting the care back into healthcare. How sad is that that we've actually got to have an initiative? But even more sad is that there's a big campaign now being run by a nurse who went in to have, um, she ended up having cancer and she went in as a patient. And she said in the first week of her life, her, her time in the hospital, nobody called her by her first name. No one. No one said, hi, Sally. So she started a Twitter campaign that's the Hi Sally campaign just to get healthcare workers to address patients by their first name. So that's one example, I think, of a really um, yeah, bad leadership <laughs> situation that I was in. And it was incredibly frustrating and disempowered me. And I felt like I had very little value. And I felt I couldn't do anything for my team and my staff in that environment because I didn't have any authority to bring about change. And there's a lovely story, and I'd heard this 20 years ago, about a, when they first put a man on the moon at Cape Canaveral, the journalists were all there, and a journalist still, he was written about this, that he went, they were all waiting for the rocket to go up, and um, he went to the toilet, and the janitor was there in the toilet, and he said to this janitor, why are you, you know, why are you here? Why aren't you watching, you know, thinking he should be out there watching this amazing liftoff? And the janitor said to the journalist, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. Now, I, for me, if my organisation or my department or my private practice, that's what I want from all, and it's true, every single one of us, even a manager, is putting patients and serving patients. And that sense of um, ownership that we all have, it's not them, it's not them, it's us, is fundamental. And what was happening a little bit in the organisations I'd worked in recently in the UK was that there was no sense of us. It was about box ticking and measuring metrics. And it was hard for even someone who wants to be a leader to break that down. But I want to be putting the man on the moon. And I want everyone I work with to be feeling they're putting the man on the moon. Because leadership is not about an individual. I don't, I mean, I'm, there are attributes of individuals, but leadership is a team sport. We are all leaders. And there'll be some people who are prepared to put their head up and be shot down, and there'll be others who won't. You can have quiet leaders and noisy leaders, but we are all in this as one team. So then we come to the ugly, and this is me in about 2000. I was young and starry-eyed, and I was so enthusiastic. I was passionate. I just got this great job at the Children's Hospital in Melbourne, and it's what I've wanted to do since I was 10 years old. I didn't know it was going to be in Melbourne, but I wanted to work with kids with disability and be their dentist. I didn't know where Australia was, but anyway, we're in Australia, and I did, I wanted to do it. I was over the moon. I felt fantastic. I had absolutely no idea what being the head of department was going to mean. I knew how to do a filling, and I was quite good at managing patients, but I had absolutely no idea about leadership and management. And so I ran off, and I did a little bit the reflective stuff, and, you know, decided that what probably we needed to do was build a team. So we'll have all these team meetings so we had some strategic planning days. And um, I mean, I was, I'm, very I'm incredibly lucky in my life. I had fantastic people, still have fantastic friends and colleagues, and they were incredibly patient with me. They were very generous, and they came along on Saturdays. In fact, one of them, um, who you'll know quite well, so I won't mention his name, but he actually brought a caftan and some incense and set it out and said, oh, we're going to have a little love-in. And he, it was all, you know, they generally took the piss out of good old little Nikki. You know, she's oh, how sweet. <laughs> Well, you know, we'll go with the flow. Um, and they came along. We had all these strategic planning days over about a period of two years where we talked about all sorts of things. And we came up with an action list. I was so excited. An action list of priorities. This is what we do well. You know, I did all the strengths and weaknesses, all the business school bullshit buzzword stuff came out. Had a great facilitator. 
Anyway, so we got this great list, and I went home after the second or third session, really pleased with this list, and then I looked down the list. 501 items to do, 499 had NK next to them, and two had my secretary's name against them, and that was it. And I, th and I suddenly thought, I can't do this. So I spent the rest of that second, that was by the time we were into my second year then, I spent the rest of that year trying to do the 501 things. And all, all my lovely, lovely staff, of which a few are here, all my lovely team were very happy. They made me feel good because they smiled at me a lot and they said, well done, Nikki, we love what you're doing. But I was knackered, absolutely knackered, working 25 hours a day. My husband was about to divorce me, although I wouldn't have known if he'd divorced me because I was never at home. Um, and the department and all the, the staff were sitting back there going, great, Nikki, oh, isn't she great? She's marvellous, but actually not engaged at all in the process. And that's another challenge, the bigger the organ... This was only a small organisation. I mean, like, little examples would be I'd send out an email, which were always too long, because as Stuart will tell you, I, why would I use five words when 500 will do, as you can hear? Um, <laughs> So I write these long emails, which I thought made great sense. We're going to do this, that, and all the rest of it. And I'd write, dear all, and send it out. And no one read it. Or they'd say, oh, I don't remember getting that. And then one of the, one of the other dentists in the unit said, Nikki, I never read any, any email that says, dear all, ever. <laughs> and actually, you'll be surprised to know in your organization, that's probably a very common thing. All those group emails, I see RCH staff email, delete, delete, delete. <laughs> um, so then I started writing individual emails. Well, that was completely a waste of time. So then I thought, right, there's only one who's told me he doesn't read Dear All emails, so I'll write Dear All and Joe. And <laughs> I got around that. But the bottom line was, what was happening was, I was the big boss. I was, I, I think they quite liked me because I was, you know, nice with kids and the number of complaints from parents went down and a few things like that. But bottom line was, I was running ahead of them. I thought things were going really well. But the entire team was sitting back here, um, you know, in this space, happy, fortunately, because they could have been worse, they could have been stabbing the old knife in my back, they weren't unhappy, they just weren't with me. And one person doesn't make these things happen, which is why what happened yesterday at your Innovative Innovations Day is fantastic, that there are all these exciting things happening. The challenge now is to make sure the people are coming along in the middle with you, and you're not leaving it to a few who then get burnt out. I was being ineffective. I think ugly is probably a little, you know, a bit hard, but I was an ineffective leader. And I did find a quote, because there are multitudinous numbers of quotes on leadership, but, you know, if you think you're leading and you turn around and there's no one there, you're just walking in the park. And I was doing a lot of walking in the park. <laughs> and that could still be true in your organisation. Um, in fact, I'm sure it's true in many organisations. So... Turning And that model of the inspirational man out the front, or in my case, stupid woman out the front, has changed. And we now understand, and we heard beautifully from Peggy this morning, all the sorts of idea of transformational leadership. But thinking about it possibly more as the leader, the top bod, male or female, is more of a facilitator. Yes, they've got to have vision and direction. But facilitating the rest of our activity, and that's kind of where I'm beginning to sit, so that... You might not make big steps, but you'll make steps as an organisation. The problem for us as dentists or dental professionals is we're very immediate. Toothache, pliers, toothache, gone. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. So then when we've got to make a slow change and we've got to engage with everyone and bring them along and somebody's feeling a bit sorry today, we find that quite difficult because we're, we're surgeons, really. I mean, most of us, that's what dentistry is. It's surgery, and surgery is a quick fix. Do, done, out, solve. Unlike, say, mental health, which is a different kettle of fish. So rather, we should be trying to have an, a, a culture, I think now, whereby the facilitator, the big boss, if you like, is actually even being pulled and dragged by the clinicians. Because as somebody said this morning, we, the clinicians at the grassroots, we know what the problems are. We're there every day. Um, and the clinicians need to be engaged and informing the, if you want, the managers, up, right up to the facilitator, to bring that change as an organisation. And believe you me, it's not, I'm not, I, well, I, I'm certainly not, I don't have all the answers. Yesterday I was running a clinic which had too many patients on with patients who weren't meant to be on that clinic and I had 
half my clinicians away on an emergency or something, and I was not behaving terribly well, and I was cursing my facilitator at the top, and it was all going horribly wrong. So we're not all perfect, but it, it, that would be the model of where I think we should be now. So to bring us on to the good news story was when I did get that job and I started at, um, in Melbourne, I was very lucky to meet um, the, my divisional director was a surgeon. Um, not many people say it's lucky to meet a surgeon, but I was lucky to meet that surgeon. He was the old-fashioned, archetypal, male, white surgeon. And I didn't think he and I were going to get on very well, and I think he didn't think he and I were going to get on very well. Um, but he said one thing to me right at the beginning, which um, made a lot of sense. Or oh, I took his, his, his um, advice. He said, Nikki, while you're here, he said, remember, you're in a children's hospital. We're all terribly important, and dentistry isn't really important. He basically was saying, you're a little person with a little specialty. You don't make us any money, which is true. Dentistry doesn't make a big hospital much money. Um, so you're going to have to win our hearts somehow. And so he took uh, an expression, which I didn't know at the time, but now do. He said, you need to make yourself really available. You need to be, I wasn't quite sure available for what at the time, but we didn't go there. <laughs> um, you need to be really, really available. You need to be incredibly affable, which I do find hard at times. And he said, and of course, you need to be able. And that's actually really hard for us as clinicians, just like those musicians. Because for us as dentists and dental professionals, or me as a viola player, what defines me is my dentistry. I'm a good dentist, or not as the case may be, but I'm a good dentist. But he was saying, actually, we're going to assume you're good clinically, and your credibility will come because we assume you're good clinically, but actually, you can be as good as you bloody well like, but if you're not here and you're not nice, we don't give a shit. And so for the first two years, I did what he said, which is I ran around and made sure the number one priority for our team was to always be available whenever people wanted us. So little old dentistry, a child with cerebral palsy having massive big spinal surgery with really important boys with sores and all sorts of things, but they wanted a little tooth out. Of course I'll go. Whenever you like, I'm there. And I spent two years, and I said to, used to say to our registrars, I don't care what you're doing. I want you to be responsive. You are the face of oral health in this hospital. And I want every doctor to go, oh, you've got a great registrar, always available, always nice. So that we built clinical partnerships. We were available. They don't know what we do. Doctors don't know what dentists do. They don't often really care what we do. But they knew that when they needed something doing, we were there, we were available, and we were affable. We were pleasant, we were nice, which is not always common amongst all hospital teams. And they assumed we were able and I think generally we were. So building those clinical partnerships. And it was really interesting. There was a time about three years into this job when I didn't have a registrar. And it was actually because um, the person who was meant to be coming was unwell and couldn't come. And word got out around the hospital that the dental, you know, Nikki's not got a registrar. And the head of orthopaedics assumed it was because the hospital had cut, cut the budget. Um, so he went storming up, unbeknownst to me, to the CEO, and he said, this is a disgrace. You need to have a dental registrar. And I remember the CEO coming down saying, what's this about no registrar? And I didn't know what had happened. Um, but it was really fantastic for little old dentistry to have the professor of orthopedics go up there and tell the executive that the they needed to have a dental registrar in their children's hospital. And that didn't come about through anything I'd said or jumped up and down. It's because we'd been available and affable, and our registrars had worked their butt off. And actually, at that time, our registrars were working unpaid. They got no pay for their on-call work at all. And subsequent to that, we then got them paid and onto a proper roster. And so whoever... Two minutes, right. Three minutes. The second partnership that I was fortunate enough to acquire in this position and has, is a harder one is managerial partnerships. And I remember saying, I hate spreadsheets. In fact, I got sent a spreadsheet by my husband recently, and he sent a spreadsheet, and I just wrote back saying, I prefer bedsheets to spreadsheets, because <laughs> I hate them. But spreadsheets scare me, and I went to our finance guy, John Brown, and I said, John, I, hate, I, just get, I get this panic about spreadsheets, and is the, neg is the bracket ones good money? Is that in or out? I have no idea. And he said, it's okay, Nikki. I can do that. I get nervous when I see teeth. <laughs> and I realized that partnership, he was good at what he did, I was good at what I did, and together we made a team. That's going to pour water on me now. 
to make sure I shut up. So in short, I think every one of us is a leader. That's genuinely nothing to do with me. Um, it's about stepping out of our comfort zone and taking a risk. You have to be prepared, and I think we're all about to take a bit of a risk staying in here. <laughs> and you've been doing this. Can you see something that could be done better? And who can you work with to make it happen? And you'll be surprised at who's out there. And interestingly, Deb, who, I don't know where Deb is now. I've been rude about her already today, but um, she's, maybe she's not here. But Deb, I was just chatting to Deb earlier, and I quite like this um, phrase. Leadership is like the abominable snowman. The footprints are ever, everywhere, but nowhere to be seen. Because I don't think it is just about one charismatic person. It's about the team and the culture of the organisation. And I'm going to finish with two little clips. But before, I think we as clinicians, and dentists and doctors in particular, because I actually think allied health and nursing have stood up. But the dental profession and the medical profession, particularly surgical profession, have a long way to go. We, the clinicians, have to stand up and skill up. But at the same time, managers have to let go. The UK did not let clinical leaders stand up and take responsibility and get things wrong at times. They had squashed them down through their very bureaucratic processes. So I'm going to finish with one little clip, well, two little clips, just to finish with. This is one little clip that just proves, I think, a little bit about how influential a leader can be. We have our conductor again, probably being paid massive. He's got all the skills. He knows the music. And I've turned the sound off. No, I meant to turn the sound off because if we actually listen to this orchestra, he's doing all the right things. I've got to turn it up. He's great. He's been paid a lot of money. He's the leader. <laughs> so, it, it, the leader can wave their hands around as much as they bloody well like. If the team ain't there, it isn't going anywhere. And just to finish off, if I was going to be a successful leader, this is what I would be like, like to be like, just to have a little look at this. This is the complete reverse. This is what Deb wants to be. Thank you very much.